Let's bow together. Eternal God, we thank you again for this opportunity to gather uh, for Facts and Faith Fridays and receive information that is beneficial to us personally and to the communities in which we serve. God is now the God that as each presenter shares that we might gain the wisdom, the experience that they provide for us so that we can use that information to again, impact our communities for the better. Uh, we don't wanna just accept that things will have to be in a certain way, but we want to be proactive and, and provide resources and guidance for the communities that we serve. We're here, dear God, not for ourselves, but for the communities that we serve. So meet us in this time of preparation, this time of information, this time of sharing. Again, we ask your blessings upon Attorney Haynes, Dr. Wynn and Pastor Gray uh, for calling us together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you for that blessing. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Wynn and then we'll chat with Dr. Sutton for a bit. So um, again, good to see you all again. Um, I just wanted to follow up on some of what uh, Sister Rudine was saying. Um, we usually think of tobacco uh, and, uh, and my grandmother says it the way you say it though, Rudine, but that's all right. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> um, but when we think of tobacco, we usually think of tobacco and lung cancer. And while in African Americans, and you know, it is still one of the leading causes of cancer death is lung cancer, and it's associated with tobacco. The reality is stroke rates and heart attacks are also associated with smoking. And so one of the big things that I think when we um, will, and, and in fact, if you will uh, uh, give me the, uh, the grace, I will um, actually at some point present the data that we actually have and are accumulating about tobacco and what it looks like our use uh, within uh, Virginia, and particularly within the area that we live in, because I think you'd be um, shocked as I was. Having said that, you know, when we, uh, and, 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 and Reverend Ponder, I really love what you said in the context of service. We talk about service to our community. Service is an active process. Um, it's an act of understanding history, but understanding the active process of how we're serving now. And so I think that that might be a topic in the future um, of, of discussion. I'll apologize for Dr. Gibbons. Um, occasionally they do get called by people with imagine this within the federal government or within the NIH itself. Um, he unfortunately wasn't able to be here, um, but he has indicated um, um, from his office that he, he wants to um, wants to make sure that um, cardiovascular disease in African-Americans and in, uh, and, and in groups, uh, other groups is discussed here at Facts Faith Friday. Um, new news. I don't really have anything other than tell you than the fact that um, from a COVID sort of perspective, we know that the rates continue to go down, the PCR positivity rates. We are bracing for a, uh, a stormy winter, um, um, which will lead us to making sure that we understand the difference between just getting COVID without the flu, but we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Um, the only other thing I would actually mention is that uh, in addition to COVID, I mean, in addition to uh, smoking, one of the other things in the African-American community and in some of our other communities, is this association with obesity and cancer. So at some point, I think we also need to be able to talk at Fact Faith Friday in an open, honest conversation about what it is we're trying to do, how it is we're trying to combat it within our communities, because a, a, a large contribution, we think, to endometrial cancer, for example, which is a, the endometrial lining for women, uh, which back 20 years ago, wasn't, didn't look like it was a problem 30, 40 years ago, the fastest growing cancer is endometrial cancer in African-American women. And it may, we believe, be associated with obesity. And so I think that between smoking, I think you're getting it, I think you're getting probably picking up what I'm putting down. I think that we do on Vax Faith Friday should have some conversations around how we are in all of our churches, getting people not just back to screening, but get people back to activity so that we can reduce the weight, stop the smoking. And lastly, um, from an alcohol perspective, I know people don't think of alcohol as, you know, maybe doing something to your heart or liver. 
usually when people say alcohol, they think, oh, just drinking, that's going to hurt my liver. Well, it turns out it not only hurts your liver, but it is a contributing cost to cancer as well. I think that we owe it to you all and to the folks uh, within your congregation and the community to be able to discuss some facts around all three of these things which are impacting the African-American uh, uh, community um, in, in an inequitable uh, and unfair manner. Um, so those will be future conversations. I just wanted to put that out there to let you know. Um, I do think that uh, we will have um, other folks from the NIH. Uh, I just had a conversation, I was telling Sister Rudine about it uh, with um, uh, Francis Collins who, who wants to come back and share some time with you. Um, the new director of the NIH uh, or the NCI, National Cancer Institute, as well as um, the excitement going around from uh, 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 Dr. Co um, uh, Dr. Fauci. So we will be interacting with these folks. These are the folks that are also impacting not only the research, but also impacting the policies around this. So I think that um, before we meet with them, I would really love to be able to have separate conversations around obesity, alcohol, and tobacco, if that's if that's acceptable to you all. So Dr. Wynn, you're stepping on toes when you start talking about people's tobacco. You're talking about, <laughs> you know, what they're eating at the dinner table, you know? Um, and what was the other thing? Oh, alcohol, right. So this is gonna be an interesting conversation, but I think people, again, more we educate folks about how all these things sort of contribute to, you know, our health issues and health ailments. I think the better off we'll be as a people. So I thank agree. you. I agree. Yeah. And actually all that contributes to not only cancer, but interestingly enough, mental health issues. So, and then we're going to talk about vaping y'all, but not right now. I got some, <laughs> I got some opinions. We're going to take baby steps, sir. Baby <laughs> steps. That's what I all got. All right. So yeah. with that, um, we're really excited. Uh, to have uh, one of our very own Dr. Anithya Sutton, who's going to discuss some data that's publicly available about COVID and influenza. And then I'll introduce for some of you, Dr. Elaine Perry. Um, and I'm supposed to introduce Dr. Wynn, but that's like talking about introducing Santa Claus on Christmas. So I'm probably not going to do that. <laughs> anyway, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Sutton. Thank you very much, Rudine. So what I'm gonna do for you all, just a snapshot. So like she said, this is publicly available data. I thought it was important to show you all these data, not only so that you see where we are, but you can also see how you can access it yourself. Most of these data are available through the Virginia Department of Health and they are updated mostly on a weekly basis. So we know that we're in this season, like we were talking, we were discussing right before we got on about how cold it was this morning. So things, respiratory illnesses and viruses are about to start pop, popping up. And so this is where we are. If you go to the Virginia Department of Health website, we're gonna start with influenza. They show beautiful trend data and they actually just started it. So as of the week ending October the 8th, this is where we were as a state. And so you can see based off the colors that we were, our intensity level across the state was very minimal. If you go to the next week, so this was the week ending last week, this is October 15th. So I expect that they will give us the most recent, probably today or tomorrow. And Dr. Perry may be able to tell us where we're gonna go with that. As you can see, we're already starting to shift a little bit in these three main areas of the state. And so these, the highest intensity level that we now see is four and those are low. As you can see, so like this chunk in the middle, this is most of us here, this is central, but we do have people throughout our catchment and beyond there on this call. And so you might find that your county or city resides in one of these areas that have changed a little bit. And so we, we see here the Hampton Roads has already started to shift a little bit. And so this is where we are. And like I said, this is the end of last week. And so if you visit the Virginia, the Virginia Department of Health, I'm sure within the next few days, we'll see where we were this week. This gives us a snapshot of who is seeking care for like they call it influenza-like illness. And so they're presenting with some of those symptoms of flu, the, the fever, the coughs, et cetera. So this is who's presenting. We're very early in the season. This orange line here shows us where we are right now. But as you can see, if you compare it to other years, we're already higher than we were for the years preceding this year. And so 3.6% of emergency department visits as well as urgent care visits are actually related to people seeking care for influenza-like illness. So we have an idea of where we are now starting the season. And I'm sure that, you know, Dr. Perry and Dr. Wynn discussed this because we generally talk about the flu season and when it starts and when it stops. And if we're in a late flu season or early one. And so it kind of looks like this year we may be in an early one, but we're going to defer to their expertise to talk about that a little bit later. 
So when it comes down to that number, like where, who is seeking care and where are they? This gives you a breakdown of the regions. And so you can see most of this is occurring in Northern Virginia that's highlighted by the green, but you can see not far behind is Hampton Roads. And then most of us here are within the central region, like I said, so individuals in Richmond, Henrico, Chesterfield, et cetera, we're on the lower end of who's seeking care or, or from through the ED and the urgent care with regard to flu-like illness. Now, this is very telling, this is age group. And so we can see the highest proportion of ED and urgent care related visits with regard to flu are kids. Um, and so this is mostly individuals between the ages of zero and four, as you can see is the highest. And then right after them are ages, um, the ages of five and 18. And so, you know, what do we think about this? I'm sure there's some type of direct correlation between what's happening in schools, especially with regard to masking and how masking is not required and how our kids are in close proximity. And so we're starting to see kids present with these flu-like illnesses. So additional, so right now within the state of Virginia, there are currently four strains that are circulating. So there are three flu A strains and one flu B strain that is circulating. And all four of those have been detected in the central region. That is not the same as in the Eastern region where I believe only two have been. So we have all four of them here right now. Um, so far this year, there have been a total of six outbreaks and four of six of those outbreaks occurred in schools. Um, the other ones occurred in like maybe like not like healthcare facilities. I think they look at nursing facilities also. To date within our state, there have been a total of zero flu related deaths. And so if you take a look, if you scan this QR code right here, this QR code will take you directly to the surveillance website that's on VDH so that you can see the trends and you can see how those numbers move on your own. So I highly recommend that you take a look at that. If you do, can't do the code, that's the website you can go to there and you can look at the surveillance data for flu. Okay, so the shift to COVID to see where we are. This is a nice little um, graph or infographic that they provide on the, on the Virginia Department of Health website. Once again, if you scan this particular QR code, it'll take you directly to COVID related information. You can see here where we are within the state as far as cases. So we have a little over 2 million cases. Our total hospital admissions about 56,000 and our total deaths are about 22,000. If you visit the health department and you look at the individual health districts, you can see that information broken out by health district if you're interested to see what's happening exactly where you are. Here's a breakdown of the demographic data that I thought were quite interesting. And so we can see where we are as a state with regard to race and ethnicity, which I know some of us may be interested in. And so this is the, these are case rates, which means they're per 100,000 individuals. And this is only a snapshot of the past 13 weeks with regard to COVID-19. So you can see with COVID-19 for the case rates, you can see that um, black individuals have the highest case rates at about 2,123, and then white individuals fall behind us and then Latino. When you look at hospitalization rates, um, you see that white individuals have higher rates followed by black or African-American. And then the death rates um, per 100,000, you can see that it's white individuals followed by black um, individuals and then um, Asian Pacific Islander and Native American. Um, to note, they also, the Virginia Department of Health, Health also breaks down these data on with regard to age and with regard to gender. So you don't just have to, you don't just see a snapshot of race ethnicity. So if you're interested in other demographics to see what else is occurring within our state or what else is occurring within the health district, you can take a visit to the website and they will let you know what's happening there. So that is the snapshot of publicly available data. Um, I'm really excited. So Rudine is gonna go ahead and introduce um, Dr. Perry and we know Dr. Wynn because we know the publicly available data as we like to have it at our fingertips, but things change so quickly. I know that Dr. Perry has some more up-to-date data with regard to specifically the Richmond and Henrico Health Districts and maybe what's occurring with regard to flu um, and the vaccine. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Rudine so that we can move on maybe to a discussion with Dr. Wynn and Dr. Perry. Um, Dr. Sutton, thank you so much. You were right. Those facts were really, really intriguing. And, and I feel like it's very important that people know how to access it on, it on their own. So thank you for sharing the QR code and the websites. And hopefully people will look at that from time to time. Um, we're delighted once again to have Dr. Elaine Perry with us. Um, again, for some of you probably who've joined previously, you know that this isn't her first rodeo. She was with us before, um, but she was recently made um, not actually recent, it's July of 2022, she joined the Richmond Henrico Health um, District as the director. Um, just gonna give you a brief snippet of her, her bio. Um, she's a board certified preventive medicine physician and comes to 
our HHD with a wealth of local, state, and federal public health experience. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank her for her service in the U.S. Navy as a senior medical officer at two Navy medical clinics. Um, she grew up in, in upstate New York. We won't hold that against her. She attended Penn State. She graduated with a BS in biology and, uh, and honors in microbiology. She also attended Dartmouth and Brown Medical Schools, um, graduating with academic dis distinction. Um, she, she has a, a ton of accolades and awards, which I think that we all know given her role. Um, but I'm really, really excited to have her here again. Um, but Dr. Perry, you have to let Amy Popovich know that I did nothing in comparison to her in introducing you the last time, because who can <laughs> compete with Amy? Not me. But we're really happy to have you here. And I, and again, everybody knows who Dr. Wynn is, um, although I had some funny things to say about him, but we're running out of time. So um, I'm going to turn the conversation over to you two. And again, thank you for being here. <laughs> So yeah, Amy does have a very uh, wonderful way of introducing people, but but I, I, yours was was wonderful as well. Thank you so much. I always blush for those things. So so thank you. Although I don't know, we're going to have to talk about that upstate New York comment later. So I don't know about that one. So <laughs> hey, I, I, I'm with. We're you. all friendly here. We're friendly. Okay. Uh, upstate's okay. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with upstate. <laughs> So I don't know how you want to proceed. Dr. Wynn, do you want to just have this be a conversation? Were there specific questions that we wanted to go over? Um, you know, however you want, I'm, I'm, I'm flexible, whatever you think would be best. I think the first question that would come to the block would be the new vac, the vaccine elite that's out apparently has covers for four strains, um, 2A, 2B. But what we just said was that there's three A strains here and one B. And so how should we think about that? So, uh, you know, again, every year um, there's a decision that has to be made, right? Because the flu vaccines, remember at one point we were only, they were only protecting against three different strains. And then very recently they added the capacity to do four strains. Um, and, and right now this year, the recommendation is for anybody who's getting a flu vaccine to get one with four strains. They've really started trying to phase out or have essentially phased out the three strains. So a decision has to be made every year. And it's not just a U.S. decision, it's something that gets made worldwide. Because they're only current technology, they're only protecting against four, every year decisions have to be made sort of forward thinking, saying, okay, which four are we going to pick? And some years are better than others. So we know that um, not every case of influenza, not every case of flu can be prevented by vaccines. Um, you know, that people do their best. It, it's a very science-based decision. But even though um, there may be, you know, we're already seeing some virus circulating that isn't necessarily covered by the flu vaccine that there is now, that we still really think that it is very beneficial to, for people to go ahead and get it. There is good protection from the strains that are included. Um, and, and really, um, you know, this is something that we know across the board, it's not 100%, but any disease, any influenza that we can prevent really is so helpful. The consequences, as we know, can be very serious up to including, you know, fatalities. Now, because we think about, because influenza cases are reported differently than we've gotten so used to with COVID-19, you know, we think about for the last two and a half, more than that years, we've become so embedded in the data for COVID-19. And, and, you know, we know how many cases and hospitalizations and deaths. Influenza has not historically been reported in that same way, right? It's not, it's not necessary for people to report that. It's not mandated reporting. Certain situations it is, right? And, and we pay attention to those. But there's an awful lot of influenza that circulates in the community that we just don't hear about because it isn't reported. And so we look, try and look at influenza in different ways, right? We look at it in terms of some of the great data that Dr. Sutton just shared in terms of influenza-like illness, like what are people showing up to the emergency room? We do what we call surveillance, like finding out what, what people are showing up for that. Um, we can get some hospitalization data, we can get some fatality data, but influenza is gonna be different. And, and is, it's helpful for me at least to think about that one. So used to having these up-to-date COVID-19 counts, I can't tell you what the up-to-date influenza counts are because it's not that we don't report influenza as the way we have become comfortable with reporting COVID-19. So anytime that you're looking at influenza numbers, it's gonna be estimates, it's gonna be underreported, um, and it's also gonna be not incredibly specific in terms of the strain. So the number of people who have influenza that get a test is small. The number of people who have influenza that have a test that they actually figure out what type it is, 
is small as, is even smaller, right? So it's helpful information. We need to know that. We're very glad that people are starting to look at that. But I would not, particularly this early on in the season, have people get too concerned about, oh, well, I heard that there is you know, a strain out that, that isn't in the vaccine yet. Still, in, in terms of not getting vaccinated, there's still, it is so important to encourage folks to go ahead and get vaccinated because there is gonna be protection there from, from for the strains that, there's good evidence to suppose will be the ones, or at least some of the ones that will be circulating this year. So um, rumor has it that if you get COVID, you can't get the flu, or if you get the flu, you can't get COVID. Now, could you please address that rumor? Please. So, uh, you know what? I wish that was true because so many people have been COVID at this point. Wouldn't that make a wonderful season? No, no. So again, uh, it's so two very different viruses, right? Sometimes the symptoms look very similar, right? You can end up having flu that looks like COVID or COVID that looks like flu, but because they're two very, very different viruses, unfortunately, having gotten one won't protect you from the other or vice versa. And so that's why, you know, our, our health department here has a, a cute little campaign for the fall saying, it takes two, right? So you have to get both your, your influenza vaccine. So you get your influenza vaccine here and you get your COVID-19 bivalent booster here, right? You know, we're, we're doing them in both arms and, 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 you know, maybe I'm jumping ahead, but yes, you can get them at the same time. And, you know, that's what I did. And it is so, it's just like very efficient. I was like, okay, boom, boom, good. I'm done. Um, and, and really, you know, it, it is very helpful. Um, so no, they, there's not cross protection, unfortunately. I wish there was, but it really is important to go ahead to get that flu vaccine. We need them every year that there is not the long-term protection from influenza vaccines, from flu vaccines. We need to get a fresh one every fall. Um, and as we are finding out from COVID-19, we do need to get boosted. And this, these bivalent boosters, the newer, newer-ish boosters that have come out in the last month or so, really are very important because even if you had COVID-19 earlier this year, past year, you know, sometime in the pandemic, if you had COVID that was not the Omicron variants that we're seeing now, which is basically all we're seeing now, if you had a variant other than Omicron, unfortunately, that is very likely not going to protect you from getting Omicron. And so we are seeing people who are getting COVID much, you know, more than once. Um, and, and that is a very common phenomenon. And so again, getting that bivalent booster, you know, flu in one, COVID-19, bivalent booster in the other arm is, is really going to be the way to go this fall. Thank you. Dr. Perry, should we be concerned about some of the data that, um, Dr. Sutton shared with the fact that there's a higher incidence of flu at this part, part of the season with our young people. Should that make us really, you know, upset or scared? So, um, you know, I don't like, we don't like to say scared in public health, right? Like, would you say appropriately? Oh, no, never say, sorry, I won't say that word again. <laughs> it's like, you know, tsunamis, right? No, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, very definitely appropriately concerned. Yes, yeah, because one, so first of all, um, we look because our friends, uh, you know, down under, right, Southern Hemisphere, they get to experience their flu season before us or after us, depending on how you look at it. But right, we're going to say they already went through their flu season, right? There are data from um, the Southern Hemisphere to say that they had a more significant flu season than, than, than usual. And, and again, not at all unexpected, given the fact that a lot of the things that we've done the last two falls, the last two flu zins, right? We were masked, we were socially distanced, you know, we, we were doing a lot of things to help prevent that upper respiratory spit, snot transmission, right? That that was, that was, we were doing a lot of that. We stopped by and large. A lot of people did stop and that's okay, right? It, it's okay in context, but because of that, that they were seeing a lot, a larger number of flu influenza cases, flu cases in, in the Southern hemisphere. So, so not surprising. The very early indications, again, is the, the data that, that Dr. Sutton showed. It's early, but what we are seeing is there are higher numbers of, of influenza-like illness already this time of year. You know, we're a little bit over halfway through October, right? Um, and, and so, yes, that is a concern. Um, seeing it in kids, you know, kids are back in school. Obviously, they've been back in school for a while now. We all know that's a great environment <laughs> for all sorts of uh, stuff to be passed around. And, and so, again, not incredibly surprising um, that it's being passed around in those younger age groups. Um, 
A reminder, the influenza vaccine is approved for kids as young as six months of age, right? So really, we, we want the littles to get their flu shot. We want the littles to be get vaccinated against COVID-19 as well, right? But, but they're really, it is important even for little kids to be vaccinated against flu this year and every year, right? So, so that's definitely a positive step that people can take to try and help um, prevent uh, influenza in kids. You know, children, unfortunately, it is rare, thank goodness, right? But children do die from flu. I mean, we have to remember that. We know that children die from flu. We know that children die from COVID-19. Fortunately, much rarer than, than adults, but it's not zero, right? And until it's zero, we need to do everything we can to help prevent that from happening. So, uh, you know, just a really impassioned plea, um, you know, get your own shots, have encourage those around you, the friends and loved ones to get their shots too. And don't forget the littles. You know, we really, really, um, any, any child death is, is a tragedy, but particularly when it's from a disease for which there are vaccines is just absolutely heartbreaking. So, you know, again, just, I can't, if I've said it a few times, I can't say it enough really, really encourage folks to go ahead and, and get uh, and get vaccinated and get their kids, children vaccinated against influenza and COVID-19 this fall. So here's a quick question. So you have a number of faith-based leaders on this call and other people. We're back in church. We're back, you know, having services. What should be the flag of how many members that either get flu or how many members with COVID that would be a trigger that would say for that congregation, hey, go back to wearing masks or, you know, social distancing or at least just be more conservative and more aware. Is there, is there one person in the congregation of 50 or two people? Can you give us some guidelines as to when should folk be concerned about flipping the switch, going back to the um, conservative measures of masking and social distancing? So from a community perspective, it is helpful to keep an eye on the CDC community levels. And those are also, there's the, the Virginia Department of Health website that Dr. Shutton chose previously, I think just links out to the CDC webpage now, but that's something you can get directly from the CDC webpage. And that's available for all local jurisdictions. So they have them you know, by city, by county. Um, so not just in Virginia, but across the whole country, if there's, there's people who are interested in that as well. And so I think that's always a good thing to keep an eye on from a community level across the board. You know, I, I, you know right now, now, Richmond is low, Henrico is low. Uh, there may be a few places here or there throughout the state that have, have cropped back up to medium. But so take a look at that first, just as a general you know, per perspective. Um, because once we start to, if we get up to uh, medium, we're going to be a little bit more cautious. And definitely, if we get up into the red, the highest community level, um, we would definitely recommend that people wear masks indoors uh, across the board, regardless of the setting. In terms of a particular um, community, faith-based community, particular events, um, unfortunately, there's no magic number. Like we can't say, well, it's it, it, it's at ten percent you you switch over, or it, at fifteen percent, or you know one or two. I think it really is um, knowing your congregation, um, looking, uh, you know, sort of across the board to see um, the the the. the the, um, the needs of your congregation, the, um, you know, do you have a lot of people in the congregation who are older, who may have uh, uh, problems with their immune system, right? Is it more of what we would call like a medically fragile community? Um, activities with those folks, you may really want to start saying, hey, you know, it's never, it's never a wrong answer to put a mask up, right? We should never be shaming people for wearing masks, no matter what the community level is, right? If someone wants to have a mask, I think it's still a good idea. And if you have the capacity, have some available, if people want to wear them, they should wear them. If you have the capacity to have things spaced out a little bit further than, than you know, you can, that, that, that capacity, then that is still, you know, perfectly welcome and acceptable. I think you've really got, to, again, look at your community, look at the congregation, what are the, the, the medical needs um, of, of that community? Um, you know, again, if you're talking about a, a younger population, you know, very healthy, certain activities where it's folks that you're not as concerned about that, then maybe you aren't quite as proactive with some of those measures. Um, yeah, no, it, it's a person per square yard measure. So we've kind of gotten, 
Uh, I should say this. So remember, we were so, okay, it's six feet apart. No, for kids, it's three feet apart. And there was all this earlier on in, in the pandemic, there was all this very, um, okay. So I will be honest with you, six feet still makes sense for some for, for some perspective, right? You know, if you're sneezing, you're coughing, you know, six feet, there, there still are some good data to support that that's, that's a, reasonable, a reasonable distance to keep people apart, right? Recognizing though that not all facilities can support that if you want to have a full house. <laughs> um, but but I would not, I haven't seen anything that's come up more recently that sort of goes against that six feet uh, for, for adults. And then again, the, the whole idea of kids in schools being three feet was was another thing too. But, um, you know, that that's a good rule of thumb. If you, if you do feel like, all right, you know, I want people there, I want them in the, the, the benches and the pews and the seats, but I can have the capacity to space them out a little bit further, that's probably a, would be a good, a good rule of thumb. Um, and then I'm just looking at yeah the 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 comment about um fully vaccinated and boosted um you know in, in terms of singing right that's that's another um a, a good question as well you know i think for right now where we are again crossing fingers and toes at least in this community i'm speaking about richmond and henrico right now um Community levels are still pretty low. Um, you know, again, if you have choir members that, that are comfortable and, and they still want to do that, that's fine. I think that's okay to do. Um, I would definitely keep an eye on it, though, as, as the fall progresses. Um, you know, definitely with what we're seeing um, as the early indicators um, of, of flu. You know, I wish that we had a better way to look at flu so that we could have flu community levels like we do for COVID-19, but in, because it's not reported the same way, it's going to be tough. We can still really look, though, at um, flu in a little bit different way in terms of um, th there are different categories, but it's not quite that same level of, of, of uh, uh, a categorization, right? The COVID as we do for COVID, but um, you know, there are ways of, of, of looking at that as if we start to see spread a little bit more. So, you know, I, I think singing is, is fine at this point, but please do keep an eye on it because you know, I'll be honest with you, we had a, the last two falls and winters were absolutely horrible. And I, I, I'm trying to be optimistic, but I feel like I have to also have to be cautiously optimistic and we start to see flu rearing its ugly head this time of October, um, you know, knowing that there are people who just either won't or can't get vaccinated. Um, we know that people are just tired of talking about COVID, um, that, that I do have some concerns about heading into the fall. And so I would say, keep an eye on it, know your congregation, um, it, it, you know, but be willing to flip that switch, so to speak. And you can flip different switches at different times, right? You can say, okay, you know, Things are looking a little dicey, let's space out more. Things are looking a little dicey, let's you know space out our choir. Um, let, let's think about how we're gonna do music differently maybe. Um, let's be a little bit more thoughtful about adding those masks in. It doesn't have to be all or none. You can really, you know, if you can, there's a whole host of different things that you can do that we've seen can be effective over the past two and a half years uh, that, that may work you know, better or less well for, for your individual congregations. You know, thank you for that. And, and I was going to say thank you for reminding us that one of the things that I really loved about Fox Faith in the early days was that we were talking to one another about best practices and what we were doing. And I think what I just heard was that within our congregations and within the number of churches that are around, communicating amongst us about what's happening is an important thing. But as you sort of said, the distancing, maybe distancing the choir, mask and things like that should be something uh, that we share. Last question that I have uh, that has come up is if you get the flu and then you get COVID, does it increase your risk for long COVID? So, you know, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a solid answer on that. I know that there um, is still a lot we have to learn about long COVID. Um, and I think it will be interesting to see those data that come out um, over the course as, as we continue to do, as you may be aware that um, uh, there's been increased attention and funding geared towards studying long COVID because we really haven't been doing as good a job as collecting data on that. Now, I know across the board um, uh, that if you have uh, if you know, problems with the immune system, um, you would be more likely to, to develop long COVID. But yeah, Dr. Wynn, I'm sorry, I just don't have a good solid data back to answer for that other than stay tuned into something that we really need to continue to, to work on. Remember, this may very well be, so, so definitely people got COVID and flu um, over the past two years. So get me wrong, but 
I'm just concerned this may be the first year that we're gonna have a lot more data on those co-infections because flu was not, wasn't as bad the last two years. Last year was worse than the year before, right? I mean, the first year was 2020 to 2021 was lower. Last year we're seeing creep up again particularly in the spring, right? We had two bumps of flu last year, which was which was unusual. We had our bump in the winter fall and we had a bump in the spring into early summer. So really trying to, you know, as we continue to, unfortunately, probably collecting more data on that to, to see, but you know, across the board, um, it is very challenging. If you're getting two upper respiratory infections at the same time, or even close in proximity to each other, um, you're, the chance of you getting sicker from the second one that you come across is more likely because your body can only fight off so much at once. And, and when they're both working on the, some of the same systems, um, making it more difficult to breathe, the congestion, it, it really can make it much more a significant, significant illness for folks. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Um, as you may know from, from some of the questions you're getting, this group loves data. It loves to sort of talk about data. Um, and the one thing that, that we've been laser focused on for so long is sort of the positivity rate, right? Do you have a sense what the positivity rate is? And I'm not sure if it's Richmond RICO or Virginia or whatever rate um, sort of data point that you have available right now, just so we can see. Because this group, you know, just, just to let you know, Dr. Perry, this group has been together since 2020. So many of them knew that the PCR positivity rate that was 5% or less was okay. Now we're talking 10, we're wearing shorts and flip-flops as if it doesn't matter. We're back in the day, 10% would have made us go, oh my. So they're just trying to get a sense of where we are and how we're defining our numbers. So this is one of those areas where at different times of the pandemic, um, we have looked at things differently. And from a public health perspective at this point, we are not really focusing on PCR positivity as much. And let me tell you why, because I, I am all about data as well, let me tell you. So when we look at how people are finding out they are COVID positive right now, there are so many people who are testing positive only using the at-home antigen tests, which we have no way of transmitting or, or picking, you know, transmitting that into that, that percent positivity, right? The other thing is that even within people who are getting tested sort of in the, the healthcare system, so to speak, right? Seeing the number of people who are testing, getting antigen tested, right? As opposed to the PCR testing, um, which is more picked up. There's a lot of people that, that that's the case. And so my concern, the concern of others in, in, in um, public health field right now is that we we don't feel like the PCR positive, percent positivity of a PCR test is telling us things that are as useful as it may have been before just the widespread um, availability of at-home testing. And, and to try and read too much into those numbers, I'm not saying it's not helpful, but I just, I, I don't want people to be either overly alarmed or what I'm more concerned about is people saying, oh yeah, no problem. You know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's only 10%, it's only 5%, it's only whatever percent because it's such a small slice of the overall COVID-19 disease, illness, infections that, is, are, that are happening right now in the communities that we just don't feel that's, why, that, that's one of the things we really need to look at. And so when you look at what the CDC is looking in terms of, and Virginia is following that as well, like we're following that, these community levels, they don't even include percent positivity, right? The three criteria that the CDC includes in there to determine their, their COVID-19 community levels are case rates per 100,000, so number of people of, of um, reported cases per 100,000, um, COVID-19 hospitalization, and then the percentage of people who are hospitalized who have COVID-19. So looking at the overall COVID-19 burden in the hospital system, right? The, the, the percent positivity was just getting too far away from the truth, right? Like it was just getting too far away from being able to tell us anything that we felt was really relevant, that they phased that out in terms of something that was considered to be a really helpful marker. And so taking a step back, looking at those three things, overall infections, overall hospitalizations and hospital burden, so to speak, in terms of the three things that make up those COVID community levels, um, really 
at least where we are right now, seems to be uh, the most reasonable approach uh, to, to look at. So, you know, for better or for worse, I'm not saying ignore it, but I'm just saying that we're really, we view those numbers with a high degree of <laughs> suspicion at this point in terms of, is that really helpful for us? Like, is that going to make my decision any different? And, and, you know, again, I have a lot of respect for the CDC. Do they always get it right? No, none of us get everything right all the time. But I feel like where they are in terms of these community levels, trying to focus on overall burden, hospitalization burden, those probably make sense right now because we just can't get too caught up in PCR knowing that so many people um, that's just below the radar screen. Thank Dr. you. So Dr. Perry, you're, you're, you're awesome. You, you never said the word S-C-A-R-E-D. You said, don't get overly alarmed. Don't get worried. <laughs> I, I got the right lingo now. Okay. So I was, I was hoping because we wanted to sort of pivot quickly to the weekend quit program. If you wouldn't mind monitoring the chat because there's some questions yes. that people have asked. Um, and again, you all have addition, additional questions for Dr. Perry. Um, she's in the hot seat. So please send her um, your, your, your questions. And Dr. Perry, it's always wonderful to have you here. And again, this isn't the last invitation. We're gonna ask you to come back again. Um, okay. so at this point, you're welcome, you're welcome. Um, we're gonna talk about we can quit. Can we say this together? We can quit. You're not saying it with me, that's fine. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you Brad Williams, who's the Senior Program Coordinator with Massey Cancer Center. Um, he oversees the We Can Quit Tobacco Cessation Program, the Community Grant Programs, and he works to build community partnerships within Massey's catchment area. He's also an adjunct professor at Virginia State University teaching health and wellness to fresh and soft, freshmen and sophomore students. I'm used to saying 1L, I mean, it's first years and second years, but whatever, freshmen and sophomore students. I got it. Um, Brad is a native of Norlina, North Carolina. Um, it's a small rural city, 15 minutes south of South Hill. I'm a graduate of Winston-Salem State University. Um, and he has his graduate degree from um, UNC at Charlotte. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Brad. So glad that you could be here and tell us more about how we can quit. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that introduction. So as she mentioned, I'm Brad Williams. I am the Senior Program Coordinator for um, the Massey Community Outreach and Engagement Team. Um, I do want to share a little bit about the piece of community outreach and engagement that I work under. Um, we offer the following programs um, and are steadily expanding as we grow to meet the needs of the living, those living in Massey's catchment area. So we offer our community grants program, which is aimed to provide local nonprofits the opportunity to address cancer related disparities with funding to start innovative programs. So I would like to highlight that three out of the seven recipients in our first round were churches within the catchment area. They all received $5,000 and just within the first six months of the operation, our seven grant recipients have reached over 15,000 people. Next, we offer cancer resource services, providing individual education and risk reduction consultation that are focused on cancer prevention and navigating clients to resources for access to screenings or treatment services. And then lastly, facilitating basic health and cancer related discussions about prevention, risk reduction, screening, disparities, and clinical trials. So now that I've, I've kind of given you an overview of the department I work on, I would like to focus specifically on the community-based tobacco cessation program. We Can Quit. So We Can Quit, CAN being short for Conquer Addiction to Nicotine, is a free community-based five session program offered to anyone that is living in the Massey catchment area. Emphasis is on free. There's completely no cost to anyone or in any individual that is enrolled in the program. The program connects people to one of our tobacco trained specialists known as the Quick Coaches, um, which provides various supportive resources to help the individual reduce and stop using tobacco products. Now I do want to point out that we know not everyone is always ready to quit at that moment, but our goal is to make sure we inform the community of the resources that are available. Um, we want to make sure we provide them with the tools they need to be successful and provide guidance along, guidance along their journey. Um, lastly, the program aims to collaborate with both individual community members and partnering organizations to educate Virginians on the risk of tobacco use 
and the significant health and financial benefits to tobacco cessation. So why we quit, why we can quit is needed. Um, so cigarette smoking remains the leading cause of preventable death and disability in the United States, despite a significant decline in the numbers. Um, just a few more numbers, 16 million Americans have at least one disease caused by smoking. And this amounts to about $170 billion in direct medical costs. That could be saved every year if we can prevent you from starting to smoke and help every person who smoked to quit. Um, according to the CDC in 2019, 22.5% of Virginia's high school youth reported currently using any tobacco product, including e-cigarettes. Um, among Virginia high school youth, 5.5 reported currently smoking cigarettes and about 14% of adults in the state of Virginia uh, smoked cigarettes in 2019. So this is evident that there's a lot of work to be done and with increased number of smoke shops and the availability of vaping products, I'm sure the numbers are even higher now. Um, I would like to pose a question to the group. Um, so if you are able to please respond in the chat for me with a Y for yes and an N for no. A question for you is how many of you have been either confronted with someone seeking guidance on quitting smoking, or you just simply know somebody, either a family member, friend, um, a member of your church, or coworker that smokes? If you could just put it in the chat or raise your hand if you know how to use the raise hand feature. All right, so I'm seeing yes, yes, yes. There was one no. Uh, Jordan, yes, yes. Thank you for responding. I do appreciate your participation. That's always great. Um, so, so that that goes to show you that you know, there's obvious there's a problem. We all you know possibly know somebody that is smoking. Um, so the question then is, what do we do about that? And that's why this program ex is it in existence now. Study shows that with peer and social support lead coaching paired with medical treatment, a person has a better chance of, uh, with a success rate of quitting smoking than trying to quit cold turkey. Our current outreach process consists of event appearances by staff for the purpose of educating community groups on tobacco and tobacco cessation. When a person expresses an interest in the program, they are then connected to a one-on-one -on -one consultation session with a quit coach. And then a personalized quit plan is developed and tailored to the individual needs based on their tobacco usage. We then provide ongoing support throughout the process of quitting and connecting participants to others um, available resources to assist them in becoming tobacco free. A person enrolled in our program is also offered free nicotine replacement therapy, NRT, which includes like the patches you um, might have heard or seen. Um, the gum and the lozenges that they can use to, to assist them with their journey. All clients are informed that we are not medical professionals and to always consult with their primary care or medical professional during their journey, especially when they're taking NRT. I would like to give credit to the I Can Quit program, um, which many of you might have heard. Um, the I Can Quit program was a cancer base um, patient focused um, program. So patients that were um, enrolled into Massey uh, Cancer Center um, expressing uh, interest in quitting smoking, this, this program came out of that. Um, so we, we copied and, and mirrored it so that it can fit the needs for the community-based program. So those who, who don't have a cancer diagnosis can enroll into the We Can Quit program. Our goal is to overall prevent the prevalence of cancer in our communities and we hope to do so with this program. Um, some best practices include connecting people to the Quit Now Virginia Quit Line. Um, so that's a highlight to the Virginia, the state of Virginia has a program um, for anybody that's interested and in looking forward to quitting, they can call this line. They also have tobacco training specialists. And then our program is also supervised by the person who developed the Massey's inpatient program. So we need you, our religious, religious and faith-based leaders, we truly need you. As leaders of our community and the ones of our community, um, people that tend to trust and most are you. Um, so we ultimately need you. We're here to be here as a resource and offer help, but your engagement with the congregations and your impact and, uh, in your respective communities is crucial to lead in the way. 
with this program, we meet people where they are. We give them information. We guide them in any way that, we, that allows, they allow us to. And we aren't here to force anyone to do anything um, that they don't want to. Um, but I believe just providing information is powerful. And sometimes all it takes is planting the seed. Um, so this is the email that you can, you can give to anybody that's interested in quitting or anybody that's looking for more information about tobacco cessation. Um, I also have on the screen a QR code. Um, that's the code that will take you directly to our um, page to enroll anybody into our program. You can scan it, save that link, um, just in case you, know, you wanna be a resource to anybody. And you definitely can always reach out to me um, either at the We Can Quit uh, website or um, my information will be available in the chat. Um, so I would like to open the floor to any questions that, if anybody may have any. I, I'm just, to the we can quit not, 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 not really a question, but a com but, but just a comment. I want everybody to know the following word, Chantex. Chantex, you'll look it up. Turns out um, we used to say that we would not give people patches um, that were still smoking because we were worried about heart issues. We used to do lots of things. Uh, we used to say, well, we're not going to even start you on a program until you're ready. The newest literature, actually, that has been now substantiated and validated in the American Thoracic Society and many others sort of says that even if you say you're not ready to quit, Chantex and potentially Chantex plus a patch is much more effective than either a patch alone or just trying to do it on your own. Oh. Cold turkey works if you can. But why am I saying this? I'm saying this, we'll have Edith Neptune from Hopkins one day. She is the preeminent scholar in this area of um, African-American addictions, uh, particularly tobacco. She was one of the early people who discovered that there's a receptor between the brain uh, and tobacco that this blocks. I'm only saying that to you because when you get to your primary care docs and many others, they may not know. You go to your primary care doc and you probably assume, well, they know. But the reality is what Brad and others are saying is that what I want you all to be able to do is that we're going to give you the latest, the hot break, the, the, the best possible uh, medical advice based on the literature and based on the other findings. And as of now, even the American Thoracic Society has changed their guidelines in 2021. And they now say that people really who are having smoking issues probably ought to at minimum ought to try Chantex and in Trantex in the patch, if at all possible. So I put that out there so that you're armed when you're talking with people who are trying to get you to stop smoking, but importantly, when you're armed with being within your primary care office, that you can at least bring up the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Wynn. Um, thank you, Brad. Brad, one question for you. Um, do you all sort of set up booths or, um, or do you set up, you know, information sessions at churches or community festivals. So the folks on the call are interested in having you all just come out to their congregation, that that could actually be a possibility. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, we're, we're open to go to any facility that that's willing to have us to just talk and um, set up booths for anybody that's interested in rolling. Um, and then the great thing with, you know, technology now, you know, we don't have to meet in person to have a session. So all of my sessions have been virtual, either through Zoom or even just a phone call. Um, you know, it's, you know it's, we like to be face-to-face, -face, but in, in reality, you know, it's not always the case. Um, so now we're able to reach, you know, anybody across our catchment area. Um, I have a few people out in Danville that we're working with um, all the way out to, you know, the Eastern Shore, we're able to, to touch those and, and, and help them on their journey. Well, thank you so much, Brad. Really appreciate your being here. Um, and again, folks, we can quit. And we know lots of people who need to quit. So thank you. Again, great conversation today. Uh, we appreciate your patience and um, being, your being appreciative of the ram in the bush. I think we had a lot of um, interesting and, and informative topics we talked about today. Um, I'm going to give you a couple announcements, if you could just bear with me, and then I'm going to turn it over to the wonderful Reverend Cheryl Ivy Green to do our closing. But um, many of you know, Massey's Lung Cancer Summit will be held on November 2nd from 9 to 5 at the Grace um, Childhood Development Center at um, 5th Street Baptist Church. The theme is engaging the community on priorities and closing disparity gaps. Um, Massey will feature innovative lung cancer research from across VCU and the Massey Cancer Center. 
Um, breakfast and lunch will be provided, masks will be required, but there'll be a community panel, open dialogue, and an open dialogue with clinicians and presentations. Again, I think this is gonna be a pretty innovative way to get you know, you know, innovative information about you know, lung cancer and sort of where the treatments and therapies are into the community, the people who actually need to, need to hear this stuff. Um, our next closed session for the faith leaders will be held on November 4th, where we'll have youth pastor Reverend Nicole Guns and Dr. Stephanie Crew from VCU Health. Um, they'll be our invited guests and they'll speak about what we as a faith community can do to help our young people dream again. Um, I see some of our young people from VCU on the call today, so I'm happy that you're here, Pamela. Um, good to see you. And then lastly, our next public um, Facts and Faith Friday session will be held on November 18th. Mark your calendars and we will be focusing on food insecurity. It's really sad in this day and age with as much wealth that, that we have you know, across this country that we have people who, and children who go to bed hungry at night. Um, we'll hear about research that's being done in this area from Dr. Annika Hines and we'll have representatives from Feed More, an organization that many of us know uh, to provide education and resources on this topic. And we're getting into that season of Thanksgiving and the holidays when we should be thinking about others who are less fortunate than we are. So with that, I'm gonna be quiet. I know you're tired of hearing my voice. I'm tired of hearing my voice. I'm gonna turn it over to Reverend Cheryl Ivy Green to close us out in prayer. Thank you so much, Rudy. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for the blessings of this day, but especially for this time that we have gathered, gathered as the faith and the medical community. We thank you for all those who have shared today, Dr. Wynn, Dr. Sutton, Dr. Perry, and Mr. Williams, Lord God, we pray you would pour back into them all that they have poured out to us today and all that they continue to do, Lord, as they stand on the front lines of medical care. Thank you for merging us, Lord God, that we might not only seek, Lord God, to help the people we serve spiritually, but we also, Lord God, provide for them physical nourishment, Lord, that they might live better lives. So bless us as we go forth, Lord God, and continue to allow us not to give up, Lord God, because our labor surely is not in vain. We bless and praise and honor your name this day for bringing us together. In the mighty name of Jesus, we do pray. We say amen. I appreciate amen. you. Man, thank you Thanks so for much. That was beautiful. Taking us out. Appreciate you. Appreciate amen. You.